All right, the year's winding down. The holiday slowdown season is just around the corner, but temperatures aren't the only thing that's dropping. So are our boot camp prices. Don't let yourself get pulled into the holiday cookies on the couch downtime just yet, because CyberWork listeners will get $500 off most live online boot camps through the end of the year. If you're looking to land your first cybersecurity job, maybe you'll consider earning your Security Plus certification. This can be your first big stepping stone in your cybersecurity journey. And if you want to really make your resume stand out in the pile, you might want to earn your CISSP. That's one heck of a leg up. You're going to be uh, holding the most requested certification in cybersecurity job listings in the U.S. at the moment. But whatever your career goals, we have training for you. We've got certs from CompTIA, ISACA, ISC Squared, EC Council, Cisco, Microsoft, and more. And keep watching this channel through the end of the year, because in the middle of each episode, I'll be showing you around some of the offerings in some of our top boot camps so that you can see what you would be learning on your path to certification and it becomes a little more real for you. All right, look, the best gift you can give to future you of 2024 is taking decisive action now and smashing holiday season malaise with the gift of certification. Book an upcoming course before December 31st, 2023 and save $500 on your live online boot camp training. And just when you thought gift giving season was over, well, okay, I'll give you one more. Your training comes with an exam pass guarantee. Now, that means if you don't pass your exam on the first attempt, we'll provide a second attempt at no extra cost to you. I mean, come on. So don't snooze. Take decisive action in your career. Go to infosecinstitute.com slash free to learn more. Again, that's infosecinstitute.com slash free and book your next certification boot camp today. Now, don't worry about it. Don't overthink about it. And don't let the last couple of months of 2023 go on cruise control. Trust me, you are ready right now. But are you ready for today's episode of Cyberwork? Well, I hope so, because here it comes now. All right, today on Cyberwork, I am pleased and honored to welcome Dan Roberts, host of the Tech Whisperers podcast and a mentor, coach, and leader to CISOs and other tech-focused C-suite members for nearly four decades. Whew. We talk about Dan's earliest work, including coining the term developing the human side of technology, going all the way back to 1984, spearheading the CyberRx program for CISOs and those aspiring to be as well. Dan also provides a four-stage growth chart for CISOs that, quite frankly, scales just as well to just about any tech career and teases a very exciting guest on the Tech Whispers podcast coming up soon. This is a long one, but believe me when I say there isn't a single wasted moment the entire time. The advice Dan gives here is all killer and no filler. That's all today on CyberWork. Welcome to this week's episode of the CyberWork with InfoSec podcast. Each week we talk with a different industry thought leader about cybersecurity trends, the way those trends affect the work of InfoSec professionals while offering tips for breaking in or moving up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. My guest today, Dan Roberts, has mentored, studied, and partnered with thousands of CIOs, CISOs, and technology leaders for more than three decades. He first coined the term developing the human side of technology in 1984 when technology and technologists hid safely behind glass walls. Uh, fast forward to the here and now, and Dan believes there has never been a better time to be in the IT and cybersecurity professions. He has dedicated his career to ensuring IT and cybersecurity leaders and team members have the new mindsets, skill sets, and tool sets necessary to differentiate and elevate the narrative. As a student of leadership, Dan writes and speaks about the common trait of the top game-changing leaders in our profession. He notes how these differences, difference makers are not distracted by the bright, shiny objects, cut through the noise of the day, and have a laser focus on what he refers to as the seven C's of top leaders, customer obsession, culture, cultivate, courage, change, collaboration, and communication. Dan's considered one of the most connected executives in the CIO arena and is passionate about connecting great people with great ideas. Uh, CIOs appreciate his ability to energize, challenge their thinking, and build and sustain a world-class IT and cybersecurity culture and future-ready workforce. Uh, so today, of course, we're going to be talking all about CISOs uh, and all of the sort of C-suite uh, tech and uh, security uh, leadership roles, as well as Dan's uh, podcast, uh, Tech Whisperer. So uh, I love having a fellow podcaster on the show. And uh, Dan, thanks for joining me today. Welcome to CyberWork. Chris, awesome to be here. Thanks so much for all you do for our community through your uh, your thought leadership and your show. And oh. you just reminded me why I am uh, the luckiest guy ever because yeah. the work I do is pretty pretty awesome. 
I I couldn't agree more. Yeah, no, I'm 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 happy every time we get to turn the recorder on here. So, uh, to help our listeners get to know you, Dan, um, can you tell us about some of your uh, earliest interests around computers, tech, and security? I know you said uh, at the intro that uh, you're not necessarily the most tech focused person, but you have you know several decades of working with uh, upper echelon tech people, CISOs, CIOs. Uh, and just tech leadership in general. So, uh, what, what, where did this interest, um, you know, come from originally in terms of working in this specific space uh, as regards leadership? Yeah, I, I would say, uh, great question, Chris. I would say it's uh, it goes back to re- just having an appreciation for how important this work is that, mm-hmm. that folks do, but also how hard it is. And, and it ain't getting easier, right? We live right. in a we live in a VUCA world. You know, VUCA is we live in a world of volatility, uh, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. And as we go forward, it can be more VUCA. So how do you succeed yeah. as a CISO, as a CIO, as a, any, as a leader, as a technology leader? And it really kept coming back to our tagline from 1984, developing the human side of technology. And so mm-hmm. that's been our passion. It's what we think about every day when we, we wake up. And, you know, how do we help people succeed? Because... Let's face it, every company is trying to win and differentiate through technology. I'm not going to use the digital transformation phrase because everyone's tired of hearing it, but uh, how do we go win through technology and and, uh, how do we help our companies differentiate? Yeah, now um, something in there sort of caught my ear. I want to sort of ask you uh, the old time machine question here. When you developed the term developing the human side of technology in 1984, what was the tech space like in comparison to how it is in, in 2023? Obviously, security was a lot more uh, catch as catch can and a little more sort of scattered, less people to hack, but also much much more open uh, borders, shall we, shall we say. But have you seen, like, obviously the the, the VUCA, the, the complexity of modern day has changed how C-suite tech leaders perform. But what, was, what were some of the concerns back in 1984 that differ from how they are now in 2023? Yeah, that was way back in the 1900s, Chris. Uh, I know, yeah. <laughs> you know, we... Um, it's interesting because back then the language we use was different, right? I mean, mm-hmm. it was just, it was those darn users. We'll tell them what they're going to get, when they're going to get it, and yeah. uh, they'll be happy for it. And, yep. you know, I would I would quote, I had on my podcast, uh, the great Charlie Feld. Uh, mm-hmm. Charlie was one of the first CIOs back in the day, back in the 80s, 90s. And Charlie hit the, the nail on the head. He said, back in those days, Chris, we had time to sit and think and build relationships. Yeah. Like, strategic and come up with big ideas. We didn't have the technology to go do the great stuff we came up with. Fast forward to 2023, and now we've got more technology than we than we can use. We don't have the time to sit and think, no. build relationships. And so I think that's a big, big difference between between then and now and yeah. and you know how we have to fight fight through that just so we can because as a C-suite leader, as any kind of as any kind of a leader, we've got to be um, thinking more strategically, thinking about the future. How can we help our company compete, differentiate, uh, drive new revenue, drive efficiencies? Well, if we're busy doing tactics every day, uh, we're not going to get to that value. Yeah, no, that's a, I think that's a that's a great answer. Yeah, there was a there there was less immediate threat, but there was also you were also working, I suppose, with a sort of like not every single piece of like a company was touched by it in 84, you know? And so now if something goes wrong, it, you know, it can blank out the entire company and it can, you can be losing revenue and it's everything's a ticking time bomb and stuff like that. So that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. We got the, we got the tech in no time. Then we had all the time and no tech. So um, if only, uh, yeah. (laughs) Oh, but for a time machine, we could, uh, (laughs) we could, we could uh, fortify our 1984 brethren, but uh, for, as for us, uh, things are still uh, too too little time, but um, so I want to talk to uh, you about uh, your step over to your company um, and you'll please Forgive me or help me, uh, Ulia, Ulia and Company. Yeah, well, that and Associates. You can say O and A. Just O and A. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so you you've been partnering with uh, Chief Information Officers, CIOs, and Chief Information Security Officers to help them create this new mindset and create new skill sets to accelerate the maturity curve 
in their respective organizations. And so this is obviously a, a great passion of yours. You've written multiple books on the subject. You wrote Unleashing the Power of IT and Confessions of a Successful CIO. And you've worked in this space for 38 years. So um, we've already talked about your excitement around uh, working with people in IT and security and helping tomorrow's leaders get a leg up in their skill areas. But um, to pull back just a little, what are some of the common difficulties you saw CISOs and other security executives struggling with when you uh, design these programs? Great questions, Chris. You know, I thinking about that, you know, I'd say first and foremost, just blind spots. Mm. You know, we've all, we've all got them. You know, you think yeah. at, at, at the C-suite, uh, you know, that that goes away, but that's still the case. And I think a lot of that's just through self lack of self-awareness. Mm. Right. OK. We're not, we're not aware. Or we don't think about we're not intentional about how we're showing up. We're not aware of how we're perceived by others. Right. We're not, mm-hmm. um, you know, we're not thinking about which meeting we get invited to. We're just we're just glad to be in the meeting. Yeah. Right. And your brand precedes you in that room. And so I think those blind spots are a big deal. I think another one, another challenge is uh, it's kind of human nature. We hit that comfort zone. Mm-hmm. You know, I might even say we get complacent. And so, you know, what happens in this industry, in this space, it's moving so fast and uh, it can go beyond us and go past us very quickly. The half-life of a skill today, Chris, and our oh profession gosh, yes. 18 months. So yeah. we're continuously learning and pushing ourselves out of our comfort zones. You know what happens, right? Yeah. And then, there's, you know, I would say there's still a level of um, victimitis. Hmm. You know, we, you know, you hear that victim card too much. It's like, you know, we're, we're leaning back, we're reacting, we're not leaning forward and being proactive. We're, you know, you still hear the, the, the victimitis. Uh, we can't get a seat at the table. Hmm. Right. That's, that's a victim, right? So how do we change that narrative? How do we change that conversation? Uh, Ralph Lohr, who just got inducted into the CIO Hall of Fame this, this year, Ralph would say, if you can't get to see the table, if you want to see at the table, just pull up a darn chair, mm-hmm. right? And so we've got to start to change our paradigm and make sure that we're in the first meeting of a new initiative where we can have influence, we can bring a point of view, because right now we're getting invited to the fifth meeting, and I'll, I'll talk more about that later. Yeah, interesting. So, uh, you 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 mentioned a phrase to me before we started recording about. Um, so, talk to me more about what it means to show up differently within this with this capacity. I think you were kind of moving towards there, but let's sort of flesh that out a little bit. Perfect. Yeah, I think I think a way to think about that, and maybe a framework to think about it is we had done a year long study with Babson College, about 130 C level executives participated. And it turned out to be what we call the maturity curve. But what really is going on? It's about how we're showing up. Mm. And so when we're showing up in a stage one, you know, we're basically keep the lights on, pipes and plumbing. You know, we're doing the we're doing the business as usual kind of things. Hopefully, well, but that's where we're showing up. Stage two, we move up, we move up the stack, and we're becoming having more impact. We're doing more problem solving. But what's indicative of stage two? And this is really the great comfort zone of a lot of cyber and IT leaders. It's the mode of kind of that order taker. Tell us what you want. We'll go do it. Kind of, right. kind of okay. reacting to mm-hmm. stage three uh, has been the holy grail for the last twenty years. Stage three is becoming the strategic partner, the trusted advisor. Mm-hmm. We're building relationships. We're building credibility. We're building trust. Now we're getting invited to the first meeting. We have that ability to bring a point of view to influence. They want us there because they know we're going to bring business value. OK, mm-hmm. I emphasize that business value. Right. We're not showing up as the cyber person, the IT person. We're bringing business. So stage three, mission critical, because what we do matters. And then we found, Chris, very fascinating, a stage four. And this is brand new. The whole mm-hmm. idea of becoming the innovative anticipator. OK, so in the technology space, we see our enterprise. I don't care what business, what industry. We see the enterprise like nobody else does. We see it end to end the good, the bad, the ugly. Historically, we've done a very poor job of leveraging that unique vantage point. But those who do can lift up their heads. They can look up. They can look out and say, how do I orchestrate a better customer experience? How do I find ways to drive new revenue for the company? Maybe drive efficiencies, maybe even uh, differentiate or or even disrupt our industry. Mm -hmm. So here's an interesting metric for you, Chris, in those four stages. Stage three, I'll start there. Stage okay. three, that strategic partner. Yep. You invited the first meeting. I mentioned that. Mm-hmm. 
Stage two, the solution provider, i.e., the order taker. Yep. They get invited to the fifth meeting and they don't even know they don't even know that's happening, right? Yeah. yeah. Our ability to influence greatly diminish. We're chasing stuff. And if that's if you're a cyber professional and you're in the fifth meeting and you see a bad idea or you see some risk, that puts you in a really bad spot, right? That's a mm-hmm. hard place to to, uh, to work from. Yes. Stage one, we never know there's a meeting. Stuff's happening all around us, right? <laughs> yeah. Stage four, Chris, this is your meeting. You're driving. Yeah. Calling the, the meeting, meeting. yeah. You're driving the art of the possible. And so think about that. How is your team showing up today? Right? What level are they showing up in that uh, in that uh, mode? Yeah, no, that's great. And, I, uh, you know, at the, at the risk of editorializing a little bit, I feel like that particular four-stage um, approach, you know, especially if you're looking to get into – a CISO position, like this can work in just about any uh, stage you are along the way. And, you know, if you're a security analyst, that's one thing to be doing, doing your SOC duties as they've been handed down to you. And then you hit a stage two and then you start saying, asking your supervisor, how can I expand on this? And then stage three, you begin to sort of suggest uh, or you start to sort of like work intimately with them in sort of revamping how the soft works. And then stage four, you start to make your own ideas. And I think as you go up, you know, I think getting that that mindset in your head about wherever you are on this on the spectrum is probably or on the on the org chart is probably useful to sort of keep jumping you up to the next level until you hit leadership. Yeah, and part of this is just self-awareness, right? Just realizing mm-hmm. these things matter, right? Yes. And you know, if you want to have the most impact, if you want to have the greatest be, be relevant, you want to be in that first meeting. You want to be in those early mm-hmm. stages. You want to be seen as as innovative, as a trusted partner. And so it changes changes the the uh, uh, the conversation tremendously. Yeah. Now, now, in addition to your work with uh, CIOs and, and IT professionals, uh, ONA has also added such vital training strategies, and we talked about this a little bit, as the Cyber LX program. So this is a nine-month-long cohort-based program for top-of-org chart security professionals, and it's uh, designed to, quote, transform them into future-ready leaders designed and delivered by former cybersecurity executives. Participants will engage in a proven combination of workshops, networking, and mentoring. CyberLX does more than build the next generation of cyber leaders. It creates a powerful cyber community, which is something we're incredibly passionate about here as well. So uh, can you tell me more about CyberLX, Dan? What are, what, what, how is this nine-month program structured? Can you tell me how it helps to keep participants can keep themselves accountable during such a long duration and also what they should expect to have amplified and improved by the end of the program? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Uh, CyberLX, the cyber leadership experience, um, let, let me talk about why it matters first, and then I'll mm-hmm. answer your question if you're okay. So Please. why it matters. Um, the folks from Lightcast, if you haven't had them on your podcast, uh, uh, you, you really should. They've got some amazing um, insights. They're the ones who do the CyberSeq report. Uh, so anyways, Lightcast has this one data point that is just tells the story. Today in cyber, only 22% of people leading cyber teams at each level, only 22%, Chris, have prior management experience. Right. That's a problem. That's that's a tremendous risk to the organization. And, you know, we've seen this before. This was IT circa 20 years ago, right? Mm-hmm. Promote our, our smart technical people. And, and, uh, and here's the problem. If we don't do a good job of preparing them for the next role, guess what happens, Right. You know, they they fall back. They wipe out. Yeah, they wipe out. They fall back to their comfort zone to what they always did. And, you know, mm-hmm. this is the game of dominoes. And, the, you know, dominoes fall one of two ways. Mm-hmm. Right? I'll tell you how that works in this area. <laughs> one is we don't prepare our people to become managers and leaders. Right. Yes. The managers are showing up as individual contributors. Directors are showing up as managers. They've got to fall back and do that work because it's very important work. And it also fits back into our comfort zone. Vice presidents mm-hmm. fall back to directors. And now your CISO is not a CISO, right? Mm-hmm. But imagine you do a good job preparing your managers to go out and lead, do the people leadership stuff. Mm-hmm. Some of those newer skills, new muscles, right? That's what we need, that's what we need to do. Mm-hmm. Now the dominoes start moving forward. Now you got people showing up higher in the maturity curve, showing up different, having ambition, leading, leading the conversation. And so those dominoes really matter today. Unfortunately, in most organizations, the dominoes are going in the wrong direction. Hmm. So we need that 22% to 
to be over 50% really soon, or our companies are taking on risk just by the fact that we don't have people leading cyber who aren't leaders. Right. Um, so, I mean, as I say that, it becomes incredibly intuitive, right? It just makes a lot of sense. Right. So Cyber LX was a uh, an outcome of a, a sister program called Tech LX. Tech LX is the technology leadership experience. Yep. Deliver about 25 cohorts around the world every year. So big deal. We serve a lot of mid-level, manager, direct level folks. We had uh, a number of CISOs reach out to us and say, we need to do this just for our cyber leaders. We want a program. And so we we interact with about two dozen CISOs. And we said, what do you want to see different in your cyber leaders? What's the muscle we, you want to work on? And yeah. so we take them through this nine-month program. It starts off with um, an assessment to get self-awareness. Like, what is what matters today? What does good look like? Where do I fit in that uh, in that equation? So not right, wrong, good, bad, but just self awareness. Mm-hmm. Then we take them through three three workshops, and uh, the CISO said, "I need people who show up with more leadership EQ. So those those leadership skills of 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 delegating, prioritizing, communicating, putting a vision out there, motivating our people." Having the difficult conversations, you know, I need people with that with that muscle. So we do that. They also said, I need my people showing up and being showing up different, being more having more influence. You know, what mm-hmm. we do matters. We need to show up as business enablers, not the mm-hmm. cyber police. So right. how do we change the equation? How do we message different? How do we ask a different question? How do we show up as those business folks who who happen to do cyber? Those those. We call those the consultative influence skills. Yeah. Um, in the third area, no surprise, you know, a big Achilles in, the, in our cyber world, it's communication. Yeah. So we actually have a workshop around how do we do a better job with our everyday communication? You know, if we show up and we're talking about cyber, talking cyber speak and bells and whistles and features and acronyms, we're going to be perceived in a, in a certain way. If yeah. we show up and we're talking about business outcomes, business results, what matters to that particular Mm -hmm. stakeholder, that group, we're now seen in a very different light. So that's the day-to-day, we call it hallway marketing. The other thing is we teach them how to develop communication plans. So every time you launch a new capability, a new policy, a new new regulation, should have some sort of a communication plan to it. We do too much one and done communication. We do too much broad brush communication. Yes. So we we actually teach the folks in the in the cohorts how to develop good marketing plans, good communication plans. Mm-hmm. So that's the muscle that and then we basically we get we pair them up into into subgroups so they they collaborate in smaller groups offline and they do peer problem solving so they're learning from people mm-hmm. from other industries. Yep. They also it's like therapy because they realize, you know, everyone's got the same same challenges and we're all space. working on it together. Yeah, right. All working together and so those things really matter. Um, one of the incredible things we do is uh, everybody in the program gets paired up with a C-level mentor from outside of their company. We have mm-hmm. literally hundreds of C-level leaders wow. currently enrolled, some who have recently retired, who volunteer to be mentors in this program. And that has just been gold because 80% of the people who show up in these programs have never had a mentor. Yeah. That's a that's a scary thing, right? And so we want to... Yeah. We want to gift them with that, but we also want to teach them that this is not hard, you know, and and most people, if they're asked to be a mentor, are honored and they'll be glad to do that. And so go build up your your personal board of mentors, your personal board of directors, get people yeah. who can give you different perspectives. But that's that's cyber LX. It's very practical, very hands on, very real world. It's in the day in the life of a cyber leader. And uh, we're excited because we're now working with uh, with InfoSec and Cengage and making that available to your community, your community. And so that's Amazing. an exciting new partnership. Yeah. Yeah. No, we're we're I'm thrilled to hear that. I, this is the first time I was hearing of it, and I'm very excited to uh, see where that progresses. Now, I uh, just one sort of related question to that, Dan. Um, you know. You, the way you sort of put it is that the you know the CISOs had, don't have this leadership as they start and they already feel behind. They're already you know invited to the fifth meeting and so forth. Is Cyber LX still primarily for CISOs to get the insight while they're here, or is there a benefit to sort of joining this if you are sort of on the track to CISO to sort of prepare yourself? 
Great question. And uh, Chris, because that Cyber LX program was actually built for people earlier in their leadership journey. So yeah. your manager- I imagine like a security manager would benefit greatly from this, right? Exactly. In fact, there's a number of CISOs today who went through this program two, three years ago, and it just shifted their mindset about the, the about the real value that we bring to the equation, about the the value of the human side of the equation, and mm-hmm. and being business first, being people first, and so it gives us incredible joy to see people become CISOs, become CIOs who yes. have been through the program in the, in past years. And so, yeah, thanks for for clarifying that because it That's really, great. and you know those those folks in middle management. It's a hard job. Yeah. You know, we we often forget about that that level. We don't equip them. Um, you know, and we really need to lean in because they're we're often they're often called the frozen middle. Hmm. That's the brand, right? That's what they're right. referred to as in the right. in the boardroom. And so, but who do who do our people in the trenches take their cues from every day? Not the CISO. I don't get to see the CISO every day, but I see yeah. my my manager. Yep. Yep. And so we get equipped then to be, and that, and that person has no seat at the table, and and therefore you're you, you've already created a, a sort of uh, island for yourselves. Whether or not you know your manager is great or 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 otherwise, you're still uh, you know you're adrift at sea. Your entire team. Well said. Yeah. Very well said. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Cyberwork listeners, I'm just going to jump into this episode for a moment to remind you that if you book a live online bootcamp from Infosec by December 31st, 2023, you will get $500 off the price. No promo code needed, just book your bootcamp before the end of the year, and it's $500 off the normal price. So I admit it, I saved the best one and the biggest one for last. While Dan Roberts is absolutely right about the importance of vital skills, we don't call them soft skills anymore, when making yourself a CISO that companies want to hire, you also need to know the tech. There's just no way around it. The network security, the perimeter security, the physical security, and that means we're talking about the CISSP certification. So I'm just going to give you a quick look at our CISSP bootcamp so you get a sense of... Uh, what you'll be getting into. So this is a seven-day boot camp uh, aimed at the highest levels of security mastery. This is the big one, folks. You, you've been been wishing for it, you've been hoping for it, and now here is your chance. You're going to need to have uh, five years at least of experience, foundational understanding of information security before you start. That should go without saying. Uh, don't just collect it to collect it. This is something you need to know when you are in high level security. So day one, you're going to be talking about security and risk management uh, almost the whole day. In the morning, you're going to have all the sessions. Afternoon, you're going to continue with security and risk management. Evenings, we'll always have optional group and individual study. And you're going to want to take advantage of that because there is going to be a lot of information on this test and in this boot camp. Day two, we're going to cover asset security. Uh, And we talked about asset detection and uh, asset classification and so forth on the podcast. You're going to know all about what your assets are in your uh, security network, uh, as well as security engineering, including architecture, mobile vulnerabilities, physical security, and more. Uh, And then in the evening, of course, more individual study. Day three, communication and network security in the morning, identity and access management in the afternoon. That's a huge one. We've talked about uh, identity and access management. It's definitely going to be a crucial part of any security uh, strategy in the future. Uh, Day four, you're going to be doing security assessment and testing. You're going to be able to get a sense of uh, how well you did when you made your security system, and you're going to know how to test it. You're going to learn about security operations in the afternoon, patch and vulnerability management, disaster recovery, business continuity. We've had CyberWorks on all of these episodes, so go back and listen to them. Day five, you're going to be doing software development security. That's right, DevSecOps is going to be on the test, so study hard. Day six... You're going to be reviewing all eight domains of the CISSP, and you're going to be taking practice exams in the afternoon. So if you're nervous about being a, not being a test-taking person, you're going to get to see what a practice exam feels like, and you're going to be able to course correct appropriately. And then, of course, there it is, day seven. You're going to take the CISSP exam in the morning. By the evening, you should probably know whether you pass the exam. And based on our uh, knowledge of putting thousands of people through these boot camps, chances are very good you will have passed. So I don't need to tell you how important and desirable having a CISSP in your credentials are. Uh, I've seen which pages you all visit most on InfoSec resources, and it's always CISSP right there at the top. The CISSP is not easy, and it shouldn't be. This is the top echelon of security certs, but it is absolutely the best possible way to convert your technical mastery of security to potential employees, employers, full stop. 
So to get your career ready for the challenge with InfoSec CISSP Bootcamp, go to infosecinstitute.com slash free and browse the live online bootcamp offerings. Register before December 31st, 2023, and it's automatically $500 off the purchase price. All right, let's get back to the show. Uh, so um, well, let's let's talk about that as it relates to our show here. Uh, obviously, if it wasn't already apparent, CISO is is Chief Information Security Officer. Uh, for a lot of our listeners, is sort of the brass ring or the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow in terms of a career well lived. It's what people always ask us: How do I get to CISO? How do I pass my CISSP? How do I do this? How do I do that? Uh, so I know that there's a good number of differences between CISO and CIO roles and stuff. But uh, can you talk about some of the areas in which CISOs actively need to develop? and improve their soft skills. Uh, we were talking that they need to develop their soft skills and their leadership skills, but what are some of the uh, relevant areas of expertise apart from the tech-focused tech member of the C-suite here? Because, you know, I know the CISM, the the, the uh, information, you know, the, the the manager certification has gone, has, has balanced the scale more towards tech and less towards management. So that's already sort of sliding that way. They want managers who can sort of, you know, you know, uh, unclog all the toilets and do everything, you know, on the ground or whatever, which is, you know, uh, as you're saying, is is further sort of slowing things down. But like, what are what are specifically some of the soft skills that you see people uh, needing again and again? Yeah, so I'll answer that a couple different ways, Chris, if I could. One Please. is going back to that maturity curve, right? Those four mm -hmm. stages. We um, we did some further research on that to try to unpack, like, what was different about stage three and four yes. versus one and two? And we looked at a number of factors. We looked at um, org design. We looked at, at all different factors. There was one single common denominator amongst those higher performing organizations. And it was a set of core competencies. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't call them soft skills because, you know, they, they're not they're not that soft. They're pretty. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a bit. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Hold, hold that Please. thought. But what we found was that there's a, a, a set of muscle there's 15 competencies that were eerily similar amongst those higher performers. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Only one of the 15 was technical. Only one of the 15 was technical. Yep. It's things like Amazon's number one leadership principle, customer obsession. So customer, you know, customer first, the ability to communicate, the ability to, to influence, um, to be more strategic, to collaborate, um, all these things, yeah, five, 10 years ago, we called those the soft skills. But today, these are the things that differentiate. Yeah. And, I, you know, the second way, and I'd love to, to know where you want to take that from the skill perspective. Sure. The second way I would answer that is the last 18 months, Chris, like like you, I do the podcast. I'm in um, rooms about every week leading uh, panels and fireside chats. I get, I get to interact with the best, smartest people in the space. And... I'm seeing a real intentional, meaningful, measurable way of them showing up different. And I call it leading with heart. Okay. H -E, H e a r t. It's an acronym. That's what we do, right? We make acronyms, Chris. Yeah, so sure. heart. So these heart are five attributes. I'm seeing leaders show up being more humble intentionally, having more empathy, being more adaptable, more nimble, more resiliency, more transparency. So just park that for a second. That's a, a set of traits that really differentiates. But it's not a touchy-feely thing because at the same time, these same leaders are balancing that with still holding people accountable, mm -hmm. still having the hard conversations, and delivering results, delivering business results. Now, in the old days, when we started, you know, we would talk about this all the time. You know, that leader, they got that project done. They go to the finish line. Yeah, there were dead bodies behind them, but they but they did it. You know that yeah, old yeah. old style. It's mm -hmm. not that you know today. If we focus on results only, we lose our people. Yep. If we focus on heart only, we lose our job because mm -hmm. we're not delivering results. So I think leadership today, especially in a VUCA world, is all about the balancing act, and that's one of those good examples of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. So, well, OK, so, yeah, I, I sort of teased that uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about that term, obviously, uh, you know, the, the, what's colloquially known as soft skills. Uh, you know, I want to uh, I'd like you to sort of talk about that from the separation of skills required in tech leadership. 
especially a soft skills as a term, it Mm -hmm. kind of carries with it an underlying implication in some people's mind that these are somehow, you know, optional or second tier skills that you should be working on, dedicating most of your time and energy to learning all the hard tools of the trade. But as you said, only one of the 15 major blind spots people had was was sort of tech focused. So, uh, you know, what 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 do you what do you have to say about the idea of soft skills and especially how it's been um I think almost kind of inverted at this point in terms of being like the primary thing. And, you know, cause we hear it all the time on the show that uh, if you have, they're saying essentially saying soft skills, but if you have the interest, the motivation, the research skills, the passion, we can teach you the tools, we can teach you the day-to-day pieces of it, you know? And I think there's, there is sort of like that inverting of the pyramid there. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. You know, Chris, I'm, I'm a big believer that words matter. Mm-hmm. Language matters. And I think if we continue to call them soft skills, they're going to continue to be perceived in the way you described it. It's very mm-hmm. fair. What I'm seeing is a focus on calling them core, calling them essential, calling them the differentiating skills. Mm-hmm. You know, these are things that will help you personally, your team, your department, your your organization um, show up different, be differentiated. And, you know, I might highlight this with a story. And it's Please. the story, story of Klaus Jensen. Okay. Klaus Jensen uh, today is the chief innovation officer for Teladocs, um, tech, tech company serving the telehealth space, uh, very innovative company. We worked with Klaus years ago at mm-hmm. a, you can look at his bio, I won't mention the company, but he was the chief technology officer of this Fortune uh, 500 company. And he had the 500 most technical people in the company, architects, engineers. Over the course of two years, Klaus initiated this was his turn back then, 44 soft skill initiatives. Hmm. Intentional, measurable. He could tell you every one of them, okay? Mm-hmm. Fast forward a couple, and we, we did a lot of work with him on this in terms of building, helping his folks build those consultative influence skills I talked about earlier, building those negotiating skills, those ability to communicate, you know, be able to tell a story. And so fast forward two years, and I we were debriefing. I'm like, you know, Klaus, how, how is it going? How are your people doing? He says, well, technically, they are as strong as they've ever been. He said, they do that on their own. That's their that's their curiosity. That's their personal interest. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said, but what's different is my folks are now in the first meeting. Yeah. They're at the table influencing, giving a point of view. They're architecting the future of the company, even the future of the industry, because they're yeah. thinking more strategically. And so... You know, a lot of amazing things happen when you see leaders who are intentional about uh, building that new muscle, because if you've got a thousand people in your organization and you ask them, what do you need next year to be more successful? Very few goes back to the blind spots. Very few are going to say, I need more of those core skills. Yeah. Yeah. Say, give me more tech. Give me more tech. That's my that's what I know. That's what I want to do. And and um, and, and also, as, as you said, with the VUCA and the sort of uncertainty, they, there's a, a feeling that if you if you know all the new tech, then clearly I won't be, uh, you know, overwhelmed or confused anymore, which is maybe not necessarily the case. A lot of companies hire for technical skills. Yep. When there's a downsizing, they, they keep people with the um, with the core skills, the interpersonal. Well, that that jumps perfectly into my next question here. So I want to ask you about the state of soft skills as a concept in 2023. And I'm going to I swear I'm going to stop using the term soft skills here. But uh, especially as, as we stand at the far end of a year in which AI based automation has dominated the tech news cycle and the notion of people being or like the human extension of the tool becomes more of the point of focus. So uh, talking about personal skills as they stand in 2023, what do you see as areas people will need to change or improve in the years to come, both in leadership and at all points along the tech slash security org chart in terms of uh, how all this is going to change things. You know, my good friend, um, Michelle Green, she's the global CIO for Cardinal Health. It's a Fortune 14 company. Mm -hmm. Uh, Just went, just uh, started her on her first public board. Actually, she's had her first meeting yesterday. And one of the, the great Michelle-isms of all time, she has a lot of them is the land of comfort has no growth. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. We have to keep pushing ourselves out of our comfort zone. We've got to continue to be learning. We've got to be curious. Um, I think the best leaders today have two lenses. You know, leader is learner. Right. I always, I mean, the best leaders are learning, not when it's convenient, but like daily. 
every day. Mm-hmm. They're, they're learning. They're digging in. They're they're you know. And there's no excuse for it today for not to be learning. The other lens is leader as teacher. Hmm. What am I learning that I can bring back to my people? What will help them be better? What will help them elevate? What will help them show up different in that next meeting? Yeah. And so I think those are some of the things that really differentiate. And you know, you, you mentioned AI, and it's a big topic today. AI is only going to substantially increase the need for these core skills. I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and unfortunately, sometimes, well, that's I think that's all the more reason why we're going to need good communicators in the C-suite because I think a lot of uh, we see a lot of investors or you know stakeholders that see AI as a great opportunity to sort of uh, you know thin the herd a little bit as they say. Well, you know, do we really need all of these people? And and uh, yeah, you know, in certain ways, I think. Uh, understanding the, the sort of leadership and the problem solving that comes with learning these skills uh, is going to differentiate you in a way that uh, just knowing the next tool is not going to. Yeah, in the introduction, Chris, you mentioned one of the other things that I've learned, another framework, I call it uh, leading with the seven C's or the seven C's leader. Mm-hmm. And what I find is there's a common denominator is the best leaders in our space do not get distracted by the bright, shiny object, AI included, right? Mm-hmm. And that's just mm-hmm. the latest this, this is a big one. I get it. But but still, they do not get distracted by that. They stay laser focused on the seven C's are customer at the middle, mm-hmm. right? Outside in, inside out customer. They're laser focused on culture, building a, a culture of learning, a culture of innovation, a culture that people want to want to work at. They're focused on cultivate. Cultivate is all those things related to people, right? One of the biggest jobs we have as leaders at any level is knowing, growing, engaging, retaining, attracting the best people on the team. Right. That's yeah, that's, sure. that's cultivate. The fourth C is courage. Hmm. And I'll tell you, I am in so many meetings these days with CIOs and they're talking about the lack of leadership courage in their organizations. I just spoke to an organization last week. They have 15,000 people in IT. It's a, it's a big organization. Yep. And this is the top dozen people in that uh, executive team of IT. And including their CISO. And at the end of the, at the end of our session, we spent a lot of time on leadership courage. And they looked at themselves in the mirror and they're like, you know, what's keeping us from going to do these great things we just talked about? It's it's courage. Um the uh the, the next one is change. You know, as leaders, we've got to build that change muscle, not only for ourselves, be more nimble, be that technical athlete, that uh that Swiss Army knife, right? But we gotta be able to take people on that change journey. Hmm. And everyone loves change. When it's somebody else doing the changing, <laughs> right, right, but not so much when it's me because we mm-hmm. we're in our, you know, we're in that comfort zone. It's it's uncomfortable, and so as leaders, we've got to put people inside that cathedral before the first brick is laid, yeah. and get them to get so excited about the vision and the direction where we're going to go. We're going to be successful. We're going to you know don't have a lot of answers right now. It's you know we have a lot of questions, but we're going to get there. That's the change. The the, the six and seven C's. We got to be great collaborators, and we got to be great communicators. So I think those are the differentiating factors, attributes, skills, if you will, today going forward. Yeah. Well, okay. So um, just to sort of um, make a micro version of that for listeners who aren't CISOs yet, and they may be considering that career path down the line, uh, and who are not yet ready to uh, join the Cyber LX uh, coterie, as it were. Um, do you have any advice or tips for the type of skill development, leadership development, and areas of study or project experience they should be emphasizing to start this career journey on the right foot? Yeah, I mean, it all starts with self-awareness. So get get feedback, right? Understand mm-hmm. your blind spots. Ask, ask for mentors who will give you honest feedback, coaching. Yeah. Um, because that's that's really where it starts. Because if we're, you know, we we could probably do a decent job on our own. Mm-hmm. Go out and find those that aren't gonna aren't gonna give you the fluffy stuff, but they're gonna challenge you. Um I have a good I have a good friend, Alfred Anigbari, who um, opened up McDonald's in South Africa many, many years ago. And to do that, he needed to interact with Nelson Mandela. Mm-hmm. Over time, Nelson Mandela became a, a close friend, confidant and mentor. Nelson Mandela would never give him an answer. Hmm. He'd only ask him questions. Oh, sure. Make him think. He knew he yeah. had the answer, but he, he wanted to make him f- work and think. Figure and it out. Yeah. Yeah. Got, use, got, use the problem solving. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so 
you know, I think those are some ways to think about that. But that's, you know, we got to get, we got to get input, we got to get out of our own heads and get, get, get uh, input from others. And then, mm-hmm. you know, realize that, you know, I think one of the things that uh, has been very popularized in the last five, six years, this notion of strengths finder. I don't know if you know the, it's a, it's one of these um, assessment tools and it basically says, mm-hmm. understand your strengths. Yeah. And their research says, double down on your strengths. Don't worry about your weaknesses. Got it. Mm-hmm. I get it. You know, it makes it makes sense. You can get a bigger lift. Unfortunately, going back to the maturity curve, going back to those core competencies that are differentiating, 14 out of those 15 are not our strengths. Mm-hmm. And those are the differentiating skills today. And so we need to lean into some of that discomfort. We need to lean into, and, and all these things, it's not rocket science. It's not like big one big bang theory. It's just little doing little things. Some of it's just like simply knowing how to how to listen, how to interactively listen. Mm-hmm. You know, you can learn that. You you can be taught that. You can teach your team that. You know, uh, think about people you know in your world, work, personal, volunteer, church, whatever it might be, who are good listeners. Chances are, you like those people. Mm-hmm. You trust those people. You want those people on your team. So think about the brand that they walk into the room with just from that very, well, we'd say just a very basic human trait, but I always challenge people, Chris. I'm like, listen, when you go into these meetings, go in and be interested first and then be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's great. Yeah. I agree with that. We like, be, we like to go in and talk. We like to go in and, and, and tell and share. And, and, get excited and show and show our value by, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like, this is what I bring to the, uh, to the table here, but it, sometimes you have to see what else is at the table before you can <laughs> volunteer. Yeah. Remember this two years, one mouth for a reason. Yeah, there you go. Listen um, two times longer. I'm, I'm going to go off, off script here a little bit. Can you give me an example of uh, something where you had to make yourself uncomfortable to get to a certain uh, next place in your, your career or your learning? I could tell you right away. It's um, I used to be a uh, uh, more of a one-on-one interaction. That mm-hmm. was my comfort zone. And I was not the presenter. I was not the host. I would never have been on a show like this. I wouldn't have been up in front of a room of 1,500 people. Right. And I got I got pushed. I, actually, I was given the opportunity to to go and speak at a, at a significant conf, conference and uh, did it. Guess it went pretty decent. Got invited some more. And now I do. You know, I've done hundreds of these presentations. But you know, the data the data says seventy four percent of people would rather die than speak in public. Yeah. Right. So, and I always joke with people. So that means at a funeral, you'd rather be in the box than given the eulogy. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah. Wild, for sure. But, but uh, I'll tell you what, it's opened up so many doors for me, Chris. Oh, yeah. Because mm-hmm. I've done things I've ne- I never would have thought of doing. Mm-hmm. I'm in rooms I never should have been in. Um, I've got a comfort level now and, you know, doing these kind of things. And so it's a, it's, I think it's just a great example. And I'm so, so, feel so blessed to be able to do that today. Love it. That's a great answer. Uh, so uh, let's uh, let's flip it around to you here, uh, Dan. Tell me about the Tech Whispers podcast and also your regular column on the CIO.com website. Um, how did these sources of information and personal stories influence the existing work you do as a C-suite security mentor and skill shaper? Uh, and also to add, adding to that, if our listeners wanted to dip their toe into Tech Whispers, if they haven't already, and you should, uh, can you name one or two episodes that would be good places to start for them? You have really meaty questions, Chris. I appreciate your questions. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I yeah, myself, it comes down just like you said to, uh, uh, you know, I I don't have the value to I don't I can't tell you what I know. So I'll ask you what you know. And uh, and that's how that comes out. So, OK, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. But. No. Well, what I know is really indicative of the people that I hang around with, because you know, I, I, I don't know a whole lot, but I, I know uh, smart people and I listen to them and I see the patterns and I see mm-hmm. you know, how the good ones are different. And so that's what I study every day. But, you know, I see myself not as a storyteller. I see myself as a teller of other people's stories. Mm-hmm. That's what you do on your podcast as yeah. well. That's so, yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, you know, Tech Whispers is kind of a three-legged stool. So we we get the best of the best C-suite leaders and uh, we feature them on the show. And so it's, it's 
one part is a podcast. So we do that on, on video and audio. And second part is an article. I have a page on CIO.com. So if you look up Dan Roberts, CIO.com, you'll see a whole series of thought leadership. And those are articles about my guests, but it's with additional content, unique content. I've got a great editor, Jason Snyder. And he says, I'll publish anything that you write. Just don't regurgitate your podcast. So fair enough, Jason. Yep. Uh, so that's a great partnership. And then the third leg of the stool is we do a lot of social media to really amplify because we want these leaders to, um, to have a platform to tell their story, to talk about their leadership philosophies, their their CIO-isms, their CISO-isms, those expressions they use. And so that's what we do. Yeah. I also bring on what I call mystery questioners. So every show, every episode, hmm. I'll go find two, three, four, five, even six or eight people who know my guests very well, and they will pre-record a question that helps me unpack their superpowers in their voice. And so I found mentors from 20 years ago. I've had moms, I've had daughters, I've had, you know, uh, different, different things like that. So that's what we're doing on the show. And, um, you know, it's, it's just a, it's a labor of love, right? This is, uh, you know, it's not a revenue generator. It's really a way to connect. It's kind of like Uber, right? We're connecting the best leaders who have a story to tell with people who have a desire to learn from the best. And that's mm -hmm. simply what we're doing is making that connection. And if I were to steer you as a couple um, for the cyber work community, I did an episode, one of the top top three of this year with Deneen DeFiori. Okay. Deneen is the CISO for United Airlines. Hmm. Mm -hmm. She's on a number of boards. She's inducted into the CISO Hall of Fame. Uh, she is a phenomenal, phenomenal leader. You're going to see her on in big places in the future. And, and uh, people are just so inspired by her. Um, another one I would put on your radar is coming up shortly. We're launching an episode with Jim Chilton, who you would know because That's he a is a familiar the, name from here. I don't know if our listeners will necessarily know him, but I certainly have uh, uh, have met him. <laughs> Jim is amazing. So Jim is the, the CIO, CTO for Cengage. Yep. Um, which is, you know, an ed tech company out of Boston, yep. one of the best C-suite leaders out there. And Jim was also instrumental in when Cengage acquired the InfoSec Institute, which is how mm -hmm. you all are now part of part of Cengage. And so, exactly. so Jim and I, I've been, I've been, this is long over overdue. And so Jim, I've got some really great mystery questioners for you. So get ready. We're going to have some Ooh. fun recording that pretty, pretty soon, but look wow. for that uh, coming up here in December. Uh, that's that's a uh, that's amazing news. Yeah, I can't wait to uh, check that out myself. Um, actually, both of them. The uh, the, uh, the your previous guest sounds amazing as well. So, uh, Deneen. Um, so, uh, something real quickly, I wanted to, to to mention one of the things you note in the Tech Whispers podcast is that as part of the Tech for Good project, uh, each guest is given a scholarship to the technology leadership experience, which they can give to a rising technology leader at a nonprofit organization of their choosing. So, uh, Dan, can you talk about some of the recipients of these leaderships, uh, scholarships, and any particularly interesting or inspiring stories of ways that they were able to apply their learning to their organizations? Yeah, I give a lot of credit to my team, Aletten Associates. We commit $150,000 a year in scholarships to CyberLX and TechLX. And the way we do that is my guests on the show are given the ability to gift a seat in one of those programs to one of the nonprofits that they support. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's an amazing thing because the folks who get to go to the, get to leverage these these programs, nonprofits usually STEM related, they would never have the opportunity to participate in a program like this. So those folks come and they are they lean in, they make the most of it. They are just eating this up and yeah. they're in there with fortune 500 cyber leaders and, and, and tech leaders. Uh, but it's just a real joy for us to be able to make that available and to mm -hmm. do make that kind of a commitment every year. And we plan to continue to do that. And so organizations like you'll hear uh, the T200, which is um, uh, women in tech have gotten together to build build up women in tech and they're mm -hmm. doing a phenomenal job building a community. I've actually had three of our C-level leaders gift their seat to, to the T200. Uh, cool. yeah. We've Love had it. Year Up, we've had NPower, we've had MCWT uh, out, of, out of Michigan. So some are regional, some are national, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for asking that because tech for good, I think we all, you know, we've been blessed to be where we are. We're able to make these scholarships available and, uh, you know, I think it's just a way to give back to this great profession. 
Yeah. All right. So as we wrap up today, Dan, do you have any projects or initiatives on the horizon that you're uh, excited to talk about or share with our leaders? Obviously, uh, the Jim Chilton appearance is huge for us. But uh, what, what excites you about 2024 and beyond, apart from just the personal joy you clearly get from doing doing the work here? Yeah. Great word, by the way. It's joy versus fun, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Michael Smith at SD Lauder always says that he, he wants to build a culture around joy because joy is lasting. Fun is, you know, here, here and gone. But yeah. You know, we're excited about our partnership. This idea of the, of of helping to build cyber leaders. We got to we got to make a dent in that twenty two percent, and uh, we're going to do that next year. Uh, we're also launching a, a new program, Chris, called Exec LX, the Executive Leadership Experience. Mm. Okay. So this has been built for the uh, the direct reports of the CISO, the direct reports of the CIO, to really help them with their executive presence, their influence. You know how they show up as an executive. Because let's face it, these folks have more coming at them than ever before. The jobs are harder than ever before. They're not, they haven't been prepared for now, never mind be future ready. And so we want to give them a fighting chance. We want to give them that uh that camaraderie, the peer group and a cohort. And uh, you know, these are our future C-suite leaders. So let's make sure they're ready. Yeah, fabulous. So one last question uh, for all the marbles. If our listeners want to know more about Dan Roberts or the Tech Whispers podcast or Ulet and Associates, uh, where should they go online? Yeah, you know what? Uh, probably the easiest and fastest. I'm very active on LinkedIn. So if you you know if you go in Dan Roberts Tech Whispers, mm-hmm. uh, reach out. I will respond personally. I will if you have questions. If I can help you in any way, um, you know, have to do anything I can. But you know, Chris, just back to you again. Thank you so much for. What you do, uh, this this is important work that you're doing, and uh, thanks for having me. I had a had a blast. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you, Dan. Thanks so much for your your time and your insights today. This was uh, you're right, an absolute blast, and was inspiring to me as well. Uh, frankly, you're I think guest number 240 that I've done now, and it's still it's exciting when someone still really like hits a thing that you say, oh my gosh, I really have to like that. There, that <laughs> I saw a couple of my own blind spots that need addressing here, and uh, I, I thank you for that. Awesome. Well, best of luck to you and your team. Thank you. And thank you uh, to all of our CyberWork listeners and video viewers, whether this is the first episode you're listening to or you've been with us since the beginning, we are so grateful to have you along for the journey. Uh, If you have any topics you'd like us to cover or guests you'd like to see on the show, just drop them in the comments below or or find me on LinkedIn. Uh, Before I go, I want to remember, I hope you'll remember to visit infosecinstitute.com slash free to get a whole bunch of free and exclusive stuff for CyberWork listeners. So let's start with our bootcamp promo offer. This is huge. From now until December 31st, 2023, if you book a bootcamp with InfoSec, you'll get $500 off the purchase price. And that's just right off the top. No promo needed. Just go to infosecinstitute.com slash free and start to browse the available boot camps. Uh, there's, of course, our cyber uh, security awareness series, Work Bites, which features a host of fantastical employees, including a zombie, a vampire, a princess, a pirate, and an alien making security mistakes and hopefully learning from them. Uh, it's a hilarious and entertaining way to make sure you and your employees understand key security awareness concepts. Uh, check out our free cybersecurity talent development ebook, which has in-depth training plans for the 12 most common security roles including SOC analyst, penetration tester, cloud security engineer, information risk analyst, privacy manager, secure coder, and more. Once again, infosecinstitute.com slash free. And yes, the link is in the description below. Thank you once again to Dan Roberts of the Tech Whisperers podcast. And thank you all so much for watching and listening. As usual, we will speak to you next week and happy learning.